chunk of information to see if people have questions. And then also hopefully there'll be time for discussion at the end as well. So I'll start with a little bit about who I am. I'm a contact improvisation practitioner and teacher. I've been practicing for over 20 years and I'm also a body mind centering practitioner and uh, an activist and a writer and I wear many other hats um, as I'm sure many of you do as well. Um, so I, I came to this work very much uh, from a, a place of personal crisis. So when I say this work, I mean um, con cultivating consent culture within the field of contact improvisation. Um, when I was in college, my first contact improvisation teacher, who was a, a wonderful teacher, uh, but there were many instances of consent violations that happened in class one of which was uh, sexual advances from a classmate of mine. And when I brought this to the attention of my teacher, she said, you know, is there some way that you could work this out amongst the, the two of you? Because if we bring this up in the class, I'm afraid that it'll amplify or in, enlarge the, the issue. So her idea was that by shining a light on or, or discussing ways that consent uh, can be violated in a contact improvisation context, that, that, it, that it would somehow manifest that, that it would make it happen more, more often or make it more prevalent. Um, I had a similar experience around that time. I was also studying Aikido and my Aikido instructor said something similar. So I think it was just a sign of the times. It was, you know, the 90s, it was a different, it was a different era. People had different understandings of um, identity and consent and um, ways to be inclusive in spaces. So that interaction, those interactions were really um, important for me in terms of setting the tone for what I could expect while practicing contact improvisation. And needless to say, you know, throughout my practice, I had experienced and witnessed many other instances of feeling unsafe, um, experiencing um, a lack of consent culture in the space, in various contact improvisation spaces. So as I, as I went along in my contact improvisation practice, I also started to do a lot of political activism and I started to become really interested in weaving political engagement with my dance practice, specifically within contact improvisation, which is my, my favorite and most beloved dance form that I practice. So I, I practice many other dance forms. And so, you know, part of the rationale for that is really the idea that if we're going to enact social change, that we are most effective doing social change work in the communities that we're already embedded in. So if we want to do social change and we're dancers, it would make the most sense to try to do that work or impact the people who are actually already in relationship with. And so I started to do work around diversity, equity, and inclusion, which is a common, you know, kind of series of words that you hear a lot in the United States. There are a lot of people who do consulting around that. I started to do some work with Earth Dance, a retreat center in Massachusetts. Um, and I co-founded the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee at Earth Dance which was a very exciting and fulfilling experience. And so through that work, I started to think about uh, what are the ingredients or what, what could help create an inclusive environment. And I realized, and others realized, I'm not the first to realize this, that, that without a, a, a solid consent culture, um, you can't have a truly inclusive space. So that's why the title of the talk is Beyond Sex, Consent is Liberation, because often we talk about consent in relationship to 
sex and sexuality, but I think that anybody and every, every person's identity, all the different identities can benefit from and thrive from a strong consent culture. So that's part of the, that's part of the argument that I'm going to make in this talk that, that a consent culture benefits everybody, but particularly enables those who come from more marginalized identities or populations, marginalized meaning at the margins, at the outside. And I know every society has their own form of marginalization. And that coming from the United States and coming from a very specific lens because of the history of race and racism in the United States is sort of the predominant form of marginalization. But I do think that the learnings that I've, you know, um, that I've gained from doing anti-racist work, I think it's relevant to other, other communities and societies. And I'm also just very excited to hear from you all about what forms of marginalization show up in your communities and how some of the frameworks that I'm offering might apply to what you're doing and also your concerns. So of course the elephant in the room, that's like an English figure of speech. You can probably imagine what that means. The elephant in the room is that, you know, in the, in the context of a global pandemic, the necessity of a strong consent culture takes on a whole new meaning. It is, um, it is so much more acute. It is so much more about life and death. And I think that it offers us a really important opportunity to look at the ways that we might enact microaggressions or micro violations uh, against people inadvertently without knowing it with the best of intentions because now we have to be so concerned about how much distance we have from others, what our agreements are. It's always changing depending on the amount of cases of COVID-19 in your area. I'm sure where you are, it's it shifted. Um, and so that necessitates a kind of constant communication and uh, modulation consideration and uh, willingness to be flexible that I think in some ways we kind of always should have had, but uh, it, it took a global crisis, I think, for a lot of us to realize that um, there are so many instances in my daily life that I noticed, you know, before this, or that I realize in retrospect where, you know, somebody might come into my personal space or put their arm around me or make assumptions about what I was up for with dancing that I might override. In other words, like let go of or not, not say anything about because it didn't feel urgent and now there is this urgency because there's a disease that uh, is very dangerous for, for all of us. And so I'm hoping that as we move through and then out of the pandemic, that we will be able to take some of the learnings without, without carrying the, you know, the fear and trauma too much. Uh, we'll see how we do with all of that. But I think that... Um, you know, I'm certainly not advocating for a kind of armoring or gripping or holding or defending that, you know, takes us out of relationship with each other, which I feel like a lot of us have embodied at different points during this pandemic. But I do think that some of the aspects of pausing, breathing, noticing, asking, waiting, considering, and, um, negotiating are are all things that I that I hope that we will become more practiced at through this through this uh, terrible situation that we find ourselves in so that's to say that you know I'm going to speak about consent as it relates to contact improvisation with the assumption that you know, at some point in the future, we will all be gathering under, you know, 
normal circumstances again, whatever that means. But I think that everything that I say and everything that you hear is going to be colored by the experience that we're all going through right now. So I wanted to name that. Mm. I've already said a lot, even though I haven't gotten into the theory yet um, and the practice of consent culture. I'm going to get into a bit about identities, um, why consent culture should be beyond sex and sexuality. I'm going to share some terms and definitions that I work with, some uh, observations and challenges that I've seen in different communities, and then some strategies for cultural shifts. And so that's the kind of arc of the next, I don't know, 20 to 30 minutes. But I also just am curious, is there anything that I've said so far that anyone has any questions about? You're welcome to type in the chat if you're on your own personal Zoom. If there's anybody in the space who has a question, you can unmute and holler, holler in my direction. Okay, um, I just want to clear, um, when, you, when you talk about consent culture uh, at the moment, uh, I don't know what you mean by that. I was wondering, like a definition, like a clear definition of that. And then also, um, a microaggression, a clear definition of that. And, mm -hmm. what, and one other question, uh, question is, what do you do with people in your community who don't agree with you? Who don't what? Agree with you. Who don't agree with me? So all of those questions are going to get answered in the rest of my talk. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll definitely define microaggression and what is consent culture, and I'll talk about challenges and, and ways that I experience and have seen resistance to this work. Um, does anyone else have any questions about something that I've said so far? Maybe related to my story or the pandemic. There'll be other opportunities for questions. I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep offering material and then pausing. So just wanna make sure that nobody feels like they're getting left behind. Okay, great. So, and it's also really nice to see a lot of you kind of lying around and like moving. I'm also kind of a kinesthetic learner. So a lot of auditory, you know, verbal information can kind of saturate me. So it's nice to see people taking care of their bodies. Okay. So I'm going to now talk a bit about why uh, going beyond sex. So there is a term um, that's often used in the United States and it might be a term that that you've heard or maybe not because again you know different cultures and different problems necessitate different language and different solutions but in the United States we have a term called intersectionality which was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw who is a, a black woman and a, a theorist who uh, coined the term to, to describe the, the ways in which multiple identities can overlap and create really distinct individual experiences of power and or oppression. And so through that, through that lens of intersectionality and looking at different identities, I started to look at the ways that people of a few different identities in, in particular might experience a lack of consent in their communities, how that might impact them. So for example, people of color, especially black people, and I know that um, in different countries and in different societies, uh, you know, race is, is uh, addressed or described differently. But in the United States, we have a term people of color for people who are of the non-dominant racial uh, uh, population. So um, 
People of color, especially black people's bodies are under attack every day. And touch can sometimes feel like violence if it's not approached with care, respect, listening. So I often see black people in contact improvisation spaces subject to non-consensual touching of their skin and hair, for example, or generally being exotified, so turned into some kind of strange object and dehumanized and not treated like a full human being. So um, that is one way that I have seen a lack of consent culture play out in relation to race, is an exotification of people's skin and hair. Um, in relation to transgender and non-binary people, so people who, whose gender identities are not within the binary of male and female, um, will often um, experience uh, something called dysphoria, which is, which is about feeling um, disconnected from uh, the par different parts of their body and the way that those part body parts are perceived by the outside world based on gender norms. And so in those kinds of contexts, it's often important that if somebody's feeling dysphoric, for example, about you know their arms, that they that they that they're able to uh, request that people not touch their arms or touch their arms in a particular way, and that that kind of request needs to be normalized, which um, I don't think in in uh, most contact improvisation communities is the case. Another example that I've seen is people with physical disabilities, particularly those who use wheelchairs. Sometimes I see uh, uh, people um, who are not disabled manipulating the chairs or mobility devices of those who use them to get around without their consent. So using their mobility devices as if they're like an object or a toy as opposed to an extension of the person's body and and uh, a necessary way for them to mobilize throughout the world. Um, another example is um, invisible disabilities, such as those who struggle from, you know, struggle with uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, sensory processing issues, or other kinds of invisible cognitive disabilities. Um, people uh, who have these kinds of disabilities sometimes have different needs around the quality of touch and the timing. So they need the freedom to opt out of dances or negotiate a change of speed or quality in the middle of dance, in the middle of a dance without explanation or apology. And I would argue that anyone, regardless of their identity, could benefit from a culture in which trying to negotiate a shift in the quality of a dance can happen without explanation or apology. And I think that right now the discourse around consent is still very much um, in general in a kind of crude or unsophisticated or undeveloped place of just really talking about yes and no. Like, yes, I wanna dance with you. No, I don't wanna dance with you. And my interest is really in looking at the nuances of how to negotiate and renegotiate consent throughout a dance, throughout a process, that, that, um, that once consent is given to, to dance with somebody, that that doesn't inherently mean that anything that the person does in the dance is okay for the other person and vice versa. So, um, that was some that was some information about why different identities people who have different identities might benefit from a consent culture now I'm going to give some definitions about what is consent and what is consent culture these definitions are are based on things that I've read and also based on my own opinions and you might also have your own ideas I would like to think that these terms are constantly evolving as our culture evolves. So I'll just read from my notes. Consent is permission for something to happen or agreement to do something. It's about the future, not the past. It's often discussed in the context of sex, but I prefer to look at it through an analysis of power across many different identities. 
because inherent power dynamics between people, um, because of inherent power dynamics between people, I don't think it's possible to ever have perfect consent. So what that means is that even if somebody verbally gives consent, like, do you want to dance? Yes, I want to dance. How is this dance going? Oh, it's, it's great. You know, um, even if, even if uh, the person who's being asked for consent gives their consent um, enthusiastically, not just um, ambival ambivalently. So that's another aspect of consent um, as it relates to our communities. I think that enthusiasm is important. And I'm not talking about um, having a beaming smile all the time. When I say enthusiastic, I mean unequivocal, as in like, there's not a question. If there's even the slightest doubt in one's body or mind, I think that that's worth interrogating, that's worth looking at or questioning. But let's say that even if there is unequivocal, enthusiastic consent given, any two people uh, will, are going to have different power dynamics between them. And those power dynamics are going to create conditions where sometimes people might be inadvertently coerced. So, you know, the most common example is uh, a teacher um, begins to dance with a student, asks the student, would you like to dance? And the student might feel interested in dancing, but also tired, maybe concerned about their, their joints, maybe their, their muscles are tired. And the student might say yes because of an internal or external pressure to please the teacher um, and or maybe even some unspoken or implicit you know, fear of some kind of retaliation for rejecting the teacher. Now, this doesn't mean that the person who is the teacher in this story is bad. It doesn't mean that they're actively coercing the student to dance with them. What it means is that the power dynamics create conditions in which coercion could happen without anyone meaning to do it. So everyone could have the best of intentions, but you know this can play out in all kinds of really micro subtle ways and power dynamics between people are not fixed. So in one instance, perhaps, you know, um, you might have a friend who in certain contexts, you know, you work together and you're superior to them in your work. But then in another context, maybe they own the house that you live in and you pay them rent. So depending on whether you're talking about work or housing, you might have different power dynamics. Or perhaps you have a friend who comes from uh, a class background that is maybe wealthier than yours. So that person, you know, just in general, from just a societal perspective, they have, they have more security, more wealth, more status, and that could play some subtle role in your relationship. But maybe you have a gender that is marginalized. Um, or I'm sorry, maybe they have a gender that's marginalized, right? So you could have different power dynamics in relationship to class and wealth versus gender. Um, and these can constantly be shifting. And these are playing out in all kinds of conscious and unconscious ways as we navigate throughout the world and as we navigate throughout our dances. And it is playing a role. So I don't believe that there is such a thing as a perfect consent interaction or a perfectly consensual interaction where you can always be 100% sure that everybody is totally okay and happy. Um, for me, that's not really what it's about. For me, what it's about is trying to uh, create conditions where people have the most awareness of their position in relation to others. And that through that awareness of one's position, uh, there will be a higher likelihood of sensitivity and compassion and empathy for somebody else's situation. And if, if somebody knows that they're in a position of more power in a certain dynamic or relationship, they can take more care to check in and to acknowledge the power dynamic. So um, that was a lot of words about consent. And then um, consent culture is a, a group or a community 
that has a commitment to developing practices, processes, and structures to ensure that everybody has bodily autonomy and the opportunity to opt in or out of activities. It requires a community-wide power analysis that addresses how those who have marginalized identities face particular challenges and have distinct needs around their personal space and participation. So it involves a community-wide kind of education or common understanding of how this works. And so part of the reason why I give this talk is to um, instigate conversations and communities to, to start to have their own, develop their own, um, their own ideas of, of ways to focus or ways to understand power and ways to address power inequities. Um, and then of course, within the consent culture uh, definition, I'm, I'm talking about people having bodily autonomy. So that involves agency and choice having choice around how one is in their body and how one uses their body. And that feels like a really important piece. So I have some more definitions, but before I go on, I want to see if there are any questions about what I've said so far about consent. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. So thank you for the definitions, because for me, it's very important to understand the definition of consent culture, because I never experienced um, something that I felt was um, a lack of consent in the contact improvisation world. But I hear a lot, especially um, from my American friends, uh, that there is a big issue about it, especially towards this sexuality inside the contact jam. Uh, so for me, I just want to thank you for clearing some, some things that I was like questioning myself. And uh, I really enjoy when you say that we won't achieve the perfect consent because there is no perfection in our world. So if we try to achieve perfection, we just fail. So it's better for us, in my opinion, to adapt to different situations. And, and I think that's what you're trying to do, you know, to give us the, the ideas to, to create that adaptation and becoming more aware of what we should act and what we should be towards the other. Um, in this area of contact organization and dance. So thank you. No, um, thank you. I'm curious because you're saying that you haven't personally seen it. I'm wondering if you're willing, those of you who are in the studio together, if you're willing to raise your hands, if you have seen or experienced what you would describe or feel as a lack of consent. It's good to see that the majority are women. But I think culture, and we are a specific group of people, and we are a small group of people, but also this address you. I can't, uh, I can't hear what you're saying. Sorry, because I wasn't saying in the direction of karma. I was saying that we are a specific small group of people, and many of us have different experiences with contact. So, Straight away, it also shows that diversity, even of having this many people bring in their hand up, it's so many because we are so yes, That's true. And then there's also the issue of, you know, um, the power dynamic of making yourself visible by raising your hand and naming that. So that's also possible that someone might not. Also, this is a lot of information to assimilate and to process, and it's possible that, you know, people who are just encountering some of these ideas might need a few days to contemplate and think about instances in their dancing or in their lives when these problems have shown up. Um, any other questions about the terms consent or consent culture before I continue? 
curious, and it's a question out of maybe a little bit of a different context. When you talk about agency, and uh, this is a word that I can't, unless someone else can translate it into Polish. Yes, but I think it's it's not the right word. So I, if you could, from your perspective, uh, explain what mm -hmm. it means mm -hmm. as at the agency. Or yeah. The yeah, I think that's a really important important idea to to be able to embody. For me, it's about having choice, um, but it also has a connotation or a sense of um, really being able to um, be active in the community and in the space and to feel that one has like ownership of their, their personal space and also that they have the choice to um, make requests and to make their desires um, and interests known. It's about, it's not just about being able to, you know, enact one's choices, but also to feel like, I don't know, in some ways one's identity is being seen. That's my interpretation um, of that word in this context. Yes, it could be Polish, but I still feel like it doesn't meet the true meaning for me and in, in what it is in Polish language, even the word skaptus is not necessarily agency for me, so I'm like curious mm -hmm. about how it is. Mm -hmm. if, you, if I would say Kodnikovos, would it be clear what I'm talking about? And I'm sorry, that's something about the language. <laughs> Yeah, that happens. That's just the, yeah, that's the nature of the beast in translation. Um, I'm going to just finish some of these definitions. So um, the definition that I have for a marginalized identity um, is the treatment of a person or a group as peripheral or on the outside by decentering their presence, ideas, or needs. And a dominant identity is belonging to a group that is considered the baseline or the norm of a society. So societal norms are often invisible or implicit. So often when we belong to the dominant identity, uh, the norms are, are just n invisible to us. It's just comfortable. It's just what is. So I heard somebody say, like, I wasn't, I wasn't aware, hadn't experienced a lack of consent culture. And oftentimes people who come from more dominant identities, for example, people who read as, as men, uh, you know, often experience um, something that feels just like uh, a sense of com being comfortable, like things are just the way they are. And so um, the next definition is social privilege. And that refers to the ability of those with dominant identities to feel comfortable and at ease in social spaces without questioning their belonging. And so part of this work, looking at consent culture across multiple identities, is starting to develop more awareness and compassion and understanding for other people's experiences. So walking in other people's shoes. So understanding what people of different genders or ethnic or racial identities or class backgrounds or uh, you know disability status or age or any other ways that people can be identified starting to really hone our ability to understand what other people might be feeling or experiencing um, so the next definition is microaggression so a microaggression is a subtle often unintentional act of disrespect or discrimination against somebody who has a marginalized identity that dehumanizes them and or makes them feel unsafe. So, you know, an example of a microaggression, there's so many examples, but like one along gender lines could be like, for example, um, you know, if, if two people are dancing and one is a man and one is a woman and um, the man says to the woman, wow, you're actually pretty strong. 
<laughs> you know, like saying something that might sound like a compliment, but it's actually like an insult, like, oh, you assumed I wouldn't be strong because I'm a woman or, you know, I mean, so, st you know, something like that where it's like some kind of, you know, small dig into somebody's personhood that might, you know, it's called a microaggression because it's, it's like a, it's like often described as like a paper cut. But when you have a marginalized identity, you walk around with a lot of paper cuts and it starts to really hurt and it's cumulative. Um, so the term liberation, as I use it in like in the title of this talk, is the act of setting someone free from imprisonment, slavery or oppression so that they have freedom from limits on thought or personal behavior. So, you know, uh, doing consent culture as a liberatory practice, it's not just about managing harm or preventing harm or just keeping people safe. But if we, if we envision this practice of consent culture as an act of liberation, it is, it is so much more expansive and broad in terms of really creating um, conditions in a, in a community where people can be, you know, in their full creativity, imagination, delight. Um, so going beyond just safety, but, you know, toward a sense of liberation uh, for everybody. Um, and then the last term I already gave the definition of intersectionality. So I'm going to move on to observations and challenges I've seen in various communities. But before I do that, does anybody have any questions about the terms I just defined? Okay. So, um, so in the beginning, somebody asked about, you know, what do, what do I do or what does one do if somebody uh, doesn't agree with this, with the premise of this work? Um, normally when I give this talk, I give a whole list of examples of all the different ways that I've been, uh, um, Gaslit, Gas, gaslighting is a, a term in English that's, that comes from a movie that I didn't see, but it's a really common term used in, especially in American culture, I think, that describes ways that people can kind of twist the truth or, or turn something around and, and make somebody feel like they're insane. Um, but, you know, just for the sake of time, I'm just going to describe a few different kinds of behaviors that I've seen over the years as I've offered um, these talks and also classes and workshops um, on consent culture and CI in different communities. I've offered this, you know, different places all over the world. And also in a few communities, I've offered consulting, like more in-depth consulting to um, work with individuals and communities on like the particular challenges that show up. But some of the, um, Behaviors that I've seen are deflection. So sometimes, um, you know, I'll, I'll come into a community, or I'll give this talk, and somebody might might deflect and say, "Well, yeah, this is interesting, but why why can't we just dance? You know, we're we're here together, and why can't we just dance?" Um, sometimes I get um, direct direct resistance, but the direct resistance is often um, also a deflection in that. Um, for example, um, you know, somebody might want to argue about the specific terms and not the bigger picture. Um, and there's also, um, sometimes apathy that shows up in, like, if I give a talk, um, in several communities I've been to, a lot of the women have said, where are the men? You know, why didn't the men show up to this talk? Like it's the majority women. So just the absence of the people who come from the more dominant, dominant cultures or communities um, or identities. Um, and then, you know, there's gaslighting, which is, you know, um, I mean, like for example, one time um, in one community I was in, um, there was, a, there was a man who said that just by naming the different identities that I was being divisive. Divisive meaning by dividing people into different identities, creating boundaries or borders that people could then not fully connect. 
And I think that what happens is that we have these different identities and there's this desire for everybody to feel like, oh, we're all one, we're all the same. Let's just find our common, common qualities, common experience, and let's not talk about our differences. And what ends up happening is that those who are most impacted by the differences end up um, suffering the most harm when those conversations don't happen. Um, and then there's also the, um, the sometimes a practice that I see of decentering the experiences of those who are most impacted. So um, like a lot of focus or a lot of time spent talking about uh, what it feels like to be a white man, you know, and what that experience is. And just like proportionally, there isn't as much time spent on what it's like to be a woman or a queer or somebody who's transgender or disabled or um, any of the other kinds of identities. So I've seen all these kinds of um, reactions happen. And, um, and you might even notice as you're listening, like, at, you know, regardless of your identity, you might notice these little moments of resistance of like, you know, resistance to what I'm saying or like, yes, but, or like, that doesn't apply to me or, you know, all these things that can go on in our heads or like, but I'm one of the good ones, you know, um, I'm one of the good men or, you know, um, I mean, you know, on a, in a, in a spiritual level, we're all good, <laughs> but, um, but the idea that like living in a patriarchal society, for example, one in which there's gender inequity, there's no like being a good guy because, you know, if you have gender privilege, then you just, you just embody that in, and it's like a constant life work to unpack that and to dismantle that. So, um, so those are some of the ways that I've experienced and seen resistance. And I, 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 I describe these to you because if you are interested, and I know some people um, in this room who are interested in cultivating consent culture in your CI communities, just to be aware that there are these patterns of resistance that arise. It's normal, but it's important to name it to shine a light on it, to have it out in the open, to not keep it in the shadows. Because, you know, if a community is, to not, is not going to move forward or develop or evolve, one of the ways that, that, one of the ways that communities can get stuck is by keeping, keeping patterns in the shadows and not, not uh, illuminating them. Any questions about that or comments? Anyone feeling resistance? <laughs> um, anyone that uh, questions something that you say, um, do you see that as being resistance always, or can that just be someone interested in learning more the nuances of what you have to say? Uh, I never said that having questions about what I'm saying is resistance kind of de defined it as that and what you were just saying as far as i could understand and i just um yeah for me like like i'm i'm always being told off for asking too many questions like not just in, in a in a not talking about this context but just in life in general i can remember being at school and being like you ask too many questions shut up you know? um <laughs> and I, I don't see questioning something as like uh, an act of resistance. I just see it as an act of wanting to know more fully what it is that's being talked about. Well, there is a lot going on in, in your question. There's a lot of layers. Um, so one layer is that, first of all, I'm really sorry to hear that your teachers were uh, unsupportive of your curiosity. That sucks. Um, as a fellow curious person, I also um, identify with that and, um, and affirm your curiosity. I think that there's a conflation or like a confusion a little bit in your, in your question around asking questions and being resistant. And I feel like there's maybe some, like maybe some concern because I'm in this conversation, I'm calling out specifically white men and saying like, 
you all tend to center your own experiences in these conversations. And so like, there could be some fear of like, oh no, but if I genuinely want to engage and like be in this conversation, am I going to get called out? Like, am I, am I getting some of that right? No, I think maybe you're projecting that onto me and um, I don't think that's what's happening. Um, I, I mean, to go on from that, because I think we just go back and forth, but like, I have another question, and that was like, do you think that um, people are already, and have been for, you know, most of their lives, using their own modalities of dealing with the issues that you were talking about? Um, and do you see any value in, in other people's approaches and, and ways of dealing with uh, the issues you were talking about? Was it only uh, consent culture and intersectionality that can solve the problem? Well, this is the framework that I'm offering, and this is the framework that I've been invited to share with you. Yeah, and I think, that, I think that this, this back and forth right now is, is an example of the of what i would describe as gaslighting so i feel like in this moment and it's also hard on video because we can't feel each other or sense each other but i feel like there's kind of a like a spinning around or like a, a misunderstanding of my words in a way that's actually really taking us away from the core part of the conversation so i'm an invited guest i'm offering my framework and i think it has value and I would like to continue sharing what I have to offer. And if you can take or leave what you want of it, there's, there's no need for you to stay. There's no need for you to take what I'm saying as like the word of God. But, I, you know, I have been doing this work for a long time. And there is an intelligence and some deep research underlying what I'm offering. Absolutely. And I'm not just counting that at all. I just, my question is quite simple. And I, or, or you, you could have just said yes or no. But, um, in, well, instead... actually, I mean, I'm not going to just say yes or no, because I think that this is an opportunity to illustrate some of the, of the kinds of dynamics that show up in these conversations. But actually, what I would like to do is I would like to make sure that we have enough time for embodied strategies for culture shift and i would also like to see if anybody else has any other comments absolutely you i think it's more question for you because what i understood from your question was if you agree with some other approaches so maybe I'm having trouble. I'm sorry. I'm having trouble hearing. I can't see who's speaking. Uh, did, did you want to, did you want to say what, I didn't hear anything you said, is there any? Let's move on, sorry for this, let's move on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> genuinely, I am genuinely curious about that exchange, so, like, if you want to write to me afterwards, I'm going to share my email, like, anything that's coming up for you, I know there's probably, this is probably very heated and, you know, intense, and I, I would love to know more about what's going on for you, so, um, does anyone have anything else they want to say directly to yes, me or I, questions I, about? I question. Yes. Concerning all these terms you are explaining us, like gaslighting, microaggression, and other, uh, not more, but uh, is it, can I call it all together as a passive aggression? Did you call what aggression? Passive aggression. This microaggression, gaslighting, can it be a passive aggression is it as a whole? Um, that's a good question. I think that a microaggression could be passive aggressive. 
but I don't think that all passive aggression is a microaggression. And I don't think that all microaggressions are passive aggressive. <laughs> Sorry, let me explain that one more time. There's a way, there's a way in which a microaggression could be passive aggressive, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. And I want to also say that a microaggression is often uh, unconscious, that somebody might have very good intentions and they might say something that's it's a microaggression without any desire to hurt the feelings of the other person. In fact, most often that's the case. So does that, does that help or do you have a, like a follow-up question about that? Thanks. Okay. So, was there anything else? Okay, I'm just going to go, I'm going to take a couple more minutes to go through um, some of the strategies for culture shift. And then, and then we can spend the rest of the time in discussion. So, assuming that, that you and your community are interested in developing or cultivating a consent culture, there are some tools and strategies to go about doing that. And I don't offer like a strict template or a strict set of guidelines or rules because I think that every community is different. So what I normally do is I'll pose a series of questions. So um, one question I often have for communities is um, how can you modulate the change in learning in a community so that it can grow together with maximum buy-in without too much discord or drama? So how can the largest portion of a community come along for the ride? And I ask this question because there can be a community in which most people are on the same page. They, they kind of are in agreement about what needs to happen and they just need to kind of coordinate. And then there are other communities where there's like a vast difference of opinion, a vast difference of opinion in terms of what, what, uh, where, the, where the community is in terms of consent culture, the necessity of consent culture. And so, you know, in those, in those cases, you know, sometimes it involves like, taking much smaller steps or figuring out how to make changes that will include the broadest amount of people possible. Um, and different communities might have different um, availability for change. And so assessing that, assessing where is your community at? That kind of assessment can happen through discussions, through surveys, um, et cetera. And then, of course, you know, at what point, this is another question, at what point does it make sense for the leadership to take control and enforce changes for the sake of the well-being of those who are marginalized or harmed? So, for example, you know, ideally you want to be able to do community learning and growth together so everybody is shifting along and, and developing together in their awareness. If there's somebody whose behavior or some people whose behavior is causing harm, there's sometimes a point at which it's, it's uh, necessary for the people in leadership, the jam organizers or teachers to step in and set boundaries and say, no, this behavior is not okay. And we're not going to negotiate it. And I'm not going to, you know, tell you or any community where that line is, but, you know, working with a community, I might help them kind of figure out for themselves where their line is in terms of like, we can't cross this line. Um, in terms of behavior. And, um, you know, sometimes, sometimes it's up to the teachers and the jam organizers um, to use their power in a positive and healthy way to set boundaries and to keep people safe and to say, you know, these behaviors are okay, these behaviors are not okay. Sometimes um, in certain communities, the people in leadership are the ones who others are concerned about in terms of their behavior and that's more tricky and that that requires a more bottom-up approach 
that involves um, methods of community organizing and um, developing power through um, through through mass movement. So, in other words, like um, if there's a change that that uh, a majority of people want to see happen, and, and maybe there's someone or someone's in leadership who is not um, listening. There can be ways that the group can come together and say, no, actually, like lovingly, compassionately, but firmly, we've gotten together and we've decided that this is important to us. Um, so there are kind of different directions um, that the, the communication can go in, though people who have less power um, tend to require more people in order to leverage or build power um which is you know like the whole premise of union organizing in in labor um so of course you know one major part of developing consent culture is developing guidelines written guidelines and the guidelines ideally are going to draw from the knowledge and wisdom from other communities that are further along in their process so that people don't have to invent the wheel, but the guidelines also ideally emerge out of the actual context, history, values, and relationships of that community. So if you were to just take the community guidelines from, you know, let's say a, a jam that's happening in New York City and just copy and paste it for your jam in Warsaw, that's not really gonna work because your community is different. But you can read their guidelines and get inspiration from them and learn um, but ideally, the guidelines are going to be written by and for the people who they're going to be um, supporting. Um, often guidelines um, lack um, enforcement, so guidelines ideally should be enforceable. So they should include systems in place to make the guidelines actually be enforceable. In other words, like to have consequences. If somebody um, does something that goes against the guidelines, what happens? What is the process? And to actually spell that out really explicitly. Um, and then, of course, you know, methods for discerning when outside help is needed. So perhaps the leadership is, you know, negotiating some conflict amongst themselves or amongst others in the community. And at some point, it's important for people to recognize that, like, oh, wow. We've lost perspective, we need outside help. And ideally, uh, a community will already have relationships with outside facilitators, maybe facilitators from other communities who have different perspectives, or maybe facilitators you know, locally who just um, come from different fields. Um, perhaps there's you know, a therapist or someone who does conflict resolution who you have a relationship with and you are able to call on them as needed and you already have their uh, contact information. Um, and then lastly, and maybe most importantly, is uh, methods for rotating leadership. So oftentimes what happens is in, in communities, there are people who have been running the jams for many years and then a conflict arises and they are so tired. They've already been doing all this unpaid labor, you know, like, managing the space, managing the teachers, you know, there's a lot of um, invisible and unpaid labor that happens in contact improvisation spaces because it's a community, it's a community forum and um, a lot of people are not getting paid or they're getting paid very little. And so one way to prevent burnout is to have methods for rotating leadership. And that includes uh, onboarding or training young young people or newer people, which is both um, empowering to give people who just enter the community pathways to get involved, to give you know to give back, to do service, and um, to to feel that empowerment, that agency that they're you know they're an important part of the community and the space, and also it's just a healthy way to. Um, maintain a community that, that doesn't burn out. Um, so lastly, lastly, um, making sure that in this journey, if this is something you're interested in doing from whatever position you're in, in the community, to make sure that you have allies, 
and that you have support. So making sure that if you engage in a campaign to change, to create changes in your community, that you don't do it alone, that you always have a buddy, you always have an ally, somebody who you can confide in, vent with, share, um, so that you, you don't have to hold something by yourself, but ideally that you have a crew, that you have a crew of people who you can work with, who you build trust with, and, um, and also your crew doesn't have to be local. So when I do organizing around developing consent culture in my hometown community, often the people who I'm consulting, the people who I'm leaning on are people who live all over the world. Other contact improvisation practitioners who I learn with, who I grow with, who I bounce ideas off of, they share knowledge with me, they challenge me, we challenge each other, we you know, develop uh, these different frameworks like you know, to, um, to address the, the questions that were earlier about like, do I value other ideas? Well, I mean, I would say that, you know, the ideas that I'm espousing here, these are not my ideas. I mean, I've put it together in a particular way and I do, um, you know, have some intellectual, I don't know, ownership over the way that I've developed this, this presentation, but, um, it's not me. I, I learned all this from, um, the people and the diversity and equity inclusion committee, um, Richard Kim, Taja Will, um, my collaborators on the Consent Culture Symposium, Deirdre Morris, Vivek Patel, all the other presenters that you, you've probably heard about the Consent Culture um, Symposium that happened in April online. Uh, you know, I, I don't believe in activist rock stars. If you see an activist rock star, somebody who's famous for doing like a lot of social change work, you know, if you, if you really start to investigate, you see that surrounding them was like a whole community of people who were like buoying them and supporting them. Um, uh, you know, Natalia, who's, who's here, is, is um, somebody who I've received a lot of support from and spent a lot of time engaging in conversations where I've learned a lot and we've bounced ideas off of each other. So um, I think that that's really an important uh, piece to name, and I think that's an important note to end on, is that uh, we can't do this on our own. So I hope that I've been able to, to give you some ideas for inspiration. Maybe I've provoked, you know, provoked you all. I just, I just kicked the stool that this computer's on. Um, and I, you know, we have a few more minutes, so I would love to hear any other comments or questions that have arisen for you all. to share the guidelines of your community uh, later with the organization for us to also understand what kind of guidelines and which kind of steps um, we should be aware of? Absolutely. I can share the guidelines that I wrote for a jam that I had. Um, but also there is a beautiful Google Doc that Benjamin Pierce created, which is a compendium of JAM guidelines from around the world. And um, I can, I'm sure that there are a bunch of you who have those or have seen those, but if not, I can, I can send a link um, so you all can review them. Yeah. Yeah. We are opening the question time. I understand. I just want to say that maybe there's people who are with us but they're not physically with us, but somewhere behind the screens. If you want to ask any questions, um, yeah, yeah, Mary or Nico could read them also. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for um, bringing that up, that there are some people who are tuning in. And if you want to unmute and talk, or you can write something in the chat, that is very welcome. Yeah, uh, if you, the writing option is on, right, Mary? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah and I didn't mention it at the beginning. Uh, so there are some people somewhere there in the virtual spaces and the spaces of their homes uh, who are with us. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'll keep an eye on the chat. And if anybody writes a question, I will be sure to read it out loud so everyone can hear what it is. <laughs> 
so far I don't see any questions written. So if anyone has a, a verbal question, yes. Thank you so much for this. I think it's super important. I'm super grateful that you're bringing uh, all of this uh, reflection here. But uh, it's more common than question, I think. But uh, it's super interesting for me to like be in different contexts, also different cultural contexts. And I think uh, I absolutely agree with everything you <laughs> you said, and also about the identities and non-privileged identities and uh, and all of this. But I think it's even like at least for me, it's uh, I think in Pol Polish context is super important because we have completely different cultural contexts. For example, about uh, you know this power relations. I, I believe that power relations are everywhere, and in Poland maybe the, of course we have like crazy racism and, uh, and all of the same mechanisms that uh, are all over the world, but they are differently uh, placed. And for example. I think that there is, at least in, in Poland or in like my environment, there is much more of this uh, even more hidden uh, power relations that are maybe less visible. So I think it would be also important to underline that these power relations are might happen everywhere and they are always uh, between us. And even if we are only dancing or like being together with white women, still it might happen. And I think it's because also like even I believe that, uh, so, so maybe it might be that we meet with the person who we, from outside, kind of think that uh, it's easy to, to assume that, okay, we are at the same kind of uh, position because the cultural context or like the social capital is more or less, you know, the, uh, the same or like similar. But still, there is something always behind, no? And I believe that this is also like, I think in Poland is more like class or I think, yeah, that's the most important. But, but uh, there is always like much more behind and we might see it more as in some personality or the character of the person. We, we might don't know all of this, uh, this history that is behind it. But, but it still can create this, this power relations and I think it's super important to be just aware of all of that that every time even when we meet with our best friend and we know her or his story it still might happen as exactly as you said that it's not fixed and it always happens so just all the time we are more aware it's just giving us more of this negotiation and open, opening spaces because it can be also like you know the the period of the time that, that I am more fragile and vulnerable and that's it and it's also important and I think like what you are saying it's like we all benefit out, uh, out of it so, so even if uh, we are not focusing so much on this identity uh, even if it's, I'm not discussing that, uh, that it's not important, yes, but I think that uh, sometimes it's easy because I, maybe that's why I'm saying this, it's because I often uh, experience this kind of maybe not resistance but like uh, kind of the people are neglecting it because okay but we are here there is no people of color there is no transgender people or there is like we are you know in the capital city and we are only like these people here and we are only female for example or we are or you know so so okay it's kind of not our task not our topic because we are beyond it already and i think it's also not true because it's always just something happening behind so so it's super important to depends on the context to like always remember about it even we feel super safe and super uh, like we think about ourselves that we are super aware we can always be more aware absolutely like there are and there are a lot of um more subtle ways that power can play out like i don't know how it is in poland but like in the united states there's a high there's a high priority placed on people who are extroverted over people who are introverted. So like, maybe it's because of the, the United States being such an individualistic society, but like, if you're an extroverted person with a big personality, you're treated as like somehow better than if you're more of a quiet introverted person. Um, so, or for another example is like, if somebody has a trauma history, um, or more of a trauma or a different trauma history than somebody else. I mean, most, you know, most humans have experienced trauma at some point, but um, that can be another way that that power can play out. Um, people's relationship status, if they're single or married, depending on the culture that, you know, that could play a role. Um, 
So I, I totally agree with you that there are so many ways that um, people's conditions can just play a role in how they engage with others and, and the meaning that we make of our engagements, for sure. Um, uh, I had a question um, regarding inclusivity um, because uh, for me an ideal situation would be where a community is inclusive but I also realized over the years that it's an ideal which is quite far from our reality and there are situations where community split or somebody leaves the community. Do you see it as a development or do you see it as a problem? Is, mm -hmm. is inclusivity a, a, an ideal which is worth to be an ideal? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you bring up a really good point because um, if we had this ideal of like all inclusive, everybody, like when I see things written like at this jam, everybody's welcome and you know, uh, it's a safe space for everybody. And it's like, well, is it, you know, because like maybe there are stairs or there's some, you know, other obstacle or it's in a neighborhood that's, you know, hard to get to for some people or, maybe um people from certain kinds of backgrounds just aren't wouldn't be interested you know um and so i think that like the question that you're bringing up is like deeply philosophical and kind of impossible to answer because like <laughs> you know because it's like uh you know, we don't want to, we don't want to pretend that we're, this is some like utopia where it's like everybody's safe and it's great for everybody. Cause like not everybody wants to do contact improvisation and that's okay. I think that for me, my ideal is that anybody who has any curiosity about contact improvisation could theoretically find a way in to see if they like it. You know, that's like an ideal um kind of starting point um i wish i had a more concrete answer for you but um but i also think that like there is something very particular about contact improvisation the fact that it's predominantly a touch-based form now it doesn't have to be i think you can do contact improvisation in a solo state but um because of different people's cultural backgrounds or, and or trauma histories doing a touch-based form might not be ideal for everybody and that's okay too um but yeah like i just would love to see uh, uh spaces that are just more available for those who have curiosity does that answer your question or do you feel remotely satisfied or <laughs> it answers it partially yeah what do you think but I think also about other cases, like when a community splits in a contact community which is interested in an art form and a contact community which is interested in social intimate interaction. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, it's kind of division and it's, well, it's then not a big inclusive contact community, but it appears to be different things. Or a community which um, expels the um, problematic people. Mm. You have the right to live. You also use this word, right? You have, yeah, you have the right to disagree and live. Well, maybe I didn't understand what I wrote. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think what you're bringing up is so interesting to me, like, because yeah, I, I do feel that sometimes it makes sense for people, like if there's a group of people in a contact community and they feel disenfranchised, meaning they feel like alienated or isolated, like it might make sense for them to start their own jam, 
and to just like peacefully, respectfully say, you know what? We're not interested in dancing to that, that drumming that you always have. Like that drumming music is not working for us, you know? We like whatever, you know, whatever the thing is, like we just, we want to have silent jams or like we want to have jams that focus on people of this particular identity or we want to have jams that focus on, yeah, contact as an art form, um, less as a social practice or whatever. Like I think that that can be really healthy to differentiate. Um, but this question of like, you know, people leaving or being, um, being sent away, you know, I, I believe that that is like a last resort. Um, I would love to see as much reconciliation as possible uh, among differences. Um, but I also think that it's, it is okay, it is okay for people to leave and say, you know what, this is not a match. This, this, this community or the values here is not a match or for people to say, you know what, this person has repeatedly behaved in a way that is not a match for what we value, what we've all agreed upon, and we're going to ask them to leave. Um, I think that there's a lot that can happen before that, before it gets to that point. Thank you.